So welcome everyone to today's meeting of the Western Hemisphere Virtual Synthetic Seminar. We're happy to have Alex Pilak from Colombia, who's going to tell us about sections and unit rulings of projective families over the projective line. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. So today I want to talk to you guys about an application of symplectic topology to algebraic geometry. So the question that I want to talk about is something that comes to us from algebraic geometry, and in particular, Hodge theory. And using some symplectic methods, we're able to say a little bit more about this problem. So we're going to talk about sections and unit rulings over people. So let me fix some notation. So we're going to consider morphisms of smooth projective varieties over C. OK, so we have some total space, m bar. This is some projective variety. So it's some Kähler manifold setting inside of Pn. So in particular, it is symplectic. And we have some map to P1. So what do I mean by morphism? Well, by morphism, I mean that pi is a holomorphic map and away from a finite number of singular fibers, it's just a submersion. So the rough picture that you should have in your mind is something like the following. So as you generically wander around in P1, you just have this smoothly varying holomorphic vibration with fibers, complex Kähler manifolds. And then for a finite number of singular points, your space degenerates into a slightly more singular subscheme. Okay, so here I've drawn the case where the fiber is two-dimensional, real two-dimensional, but in general, the fiber of this map can be whatever dimension you want. It can be zero, it can be 77, it can be 88, whatever number you'd prefer. So by Griffith's work in Hodge theory, it was speculated that these families, when they have very few singular fibers, should be very reminiscent of actually uh, trivial families over P1. That is, their geometry should be highly constrained. And so this is what uh, my theorem goes towards state. So there are two parts to this. So the first is if we have one of these morphisms to P1 and we have one singular fiber at most, so either it's completely smooth everywhere or we maybe have one singular fiber over infinity, then we can conclude that this total space, M bar, is unirule, and in particular, it admits a section. So if we allow for two singular fibers, and we just assume that these singular fibers are at zero and infinity. And we have this technical assumption that once we remove a singular fiber over infinity, that this now open symplectic manifold over C has vanishing first turn class. So it's just clobby out. If we have this assumption, then we can conclude that the total space is again unirule. And in particular, now it admits rational multi sections. Okay, so this is sort of the main theorem that I want to talk about for most of this talk. So let me make a couple of dumb remarks to just kind of orient us around what this particularly is saying. So the first thing you should notice is that part one is a statement about sections, whereas part two is a statement about multi sections. So the obvious question is can you upgrade two to a statement about sections? And in general, you can't. Okay. So in general, if we have two singular fibers, we can't actually improve the existence of the section. And the example is rather uh, silly. So just take the total space to be P1 and just take pi to be some degree K map for K larger than one. Okay, so by a simple degree reasons, there are no sections, there are only multi-sections. Okay, so that's the first check. The second is that the projectivity assumption on this particular family is actually necessary. So as soon as we do not have some total space M bar that is projective, this theorem terribly fails. And again, the example is kind of very simple. So you take a Hopf surface. So diffeomorphically, this is just some copy of S1 times S3. And our map pi is going to be the Hopf map. So topologically, we just project out the S1 factor, and then we apply the standard Hopf map from S3 to S2. So this is some elliptic fiber chip. So the fibers of this map are elliptic curves. Okay, so you, you give this question to some first year algebraic topology student, and they will tell you that pi two of this total space vanishes. And just for homotopical reasons now, we see that there can't actually be a section for this particular family, simply because any section class is actually null homotopic. Okay, so if we don't have this projectivity assumption, then actually we just can't even get the existence of sections in these spaces. So the final question that you should ask is, well, the theorem is a statement about one and two and really no singular fibers. So what about five or 77 or 88 singular fibers? Okay, in general, there are just no sections. So the uh, example is again, kind of silly. 
just take some branched cover with three branch points over P1. Okay, so if you have some curve, which actually if we just have positive genus, or sorry, positive uh, Euler characteristic, then in particular, a genus G curve is well, not unirule, then it will definitely not emit any section classes. Okay, so these are just some sort of very simple remarks to kind of orient us around what this theorem is actually saying and the extent to which you know, it can actually be pushed. So are there any questions about this before I talk about some algebra geometric motivation? Okay. So the motivation for this comes from Hodge theory, and in particular, Griffith's work on period buildings. So for this discussion, let's let this map pi from m bar to b1 just be some arbitrary thing. So for the statement of the theorem, it had two or fewer singular fibers, but here it can have 77 and 88, however many you want. And let's define this little piece of auxiliary notation. So we're going to take p1, and we're going to remove the singular values of our map pi, and then we're going to take the universal cover of this space. So let's just do a sanity check here. If we have two singular fibers, then P1 minus two points is C star. So the universal cover is just C. Okay. So given such a family over P1, some smoothly varying family of complex Taylor manifolds, you obtain a morphism to a period domain. So there's some holomorphic map, phi, that goes from this universal cover to some moduli space here D. Where roughly speaking, this moduli space D is going to be the classifying space of polarized Hodge structures associated to your general fiber of this map pi. So this is some holomorphic manifold. And so roughly speaking, what this map does is you look at your point in P1, you look at the fiber above it, that has a Hodge structure associated to it. And then we just assign that particular fiber to its Hodge structure inside of this moduli space. Okay, so this is just some kind of classifying map for the Hodge structures. So using a distance minimizing principle, Griffith shows, among other things, that if the Euler characteristic of this universal cover is positive, then this map phi is actually constant. So let's think about this in our particular case. So if we have two or less singular fibers, then the universal cover is either C or P1. Okay, both of these have positive Euler characteristic. So this classifying map of Griffiths is actually constant. And so what this tells us is that the variations of Hodge structures of this family over the smooth locus is actually trivial. Right, from the viewpoint of Hodge theory, the actual variance of the Hodge structures is trivial. There, there's no additional sort of, um, algebraically interesting data being built into these families. So let's just orient ourselves with kind of a simple example. So this is kind of very high level and abstract. So let's just think about what happens in the case where the fiber of pi is some positive genus curve. Okay, in this case, Griffith's map is just the map that takes a curve to its associated period matrix inside of the Siegel upper half space. The Siegel upper half space is some hyperbolic manifold and so in particular, if I have a holomorphic map of a positive Euler characteristic or a positively curved curve into a hyperbolic manifold, well, then it will be constant. Okay, so th this is sort of the dimension one analog of Griffith's result. So this is just some basic Riemann surface theory. So the question that kind of always arises whenever you have some type of Hodge theoretic feature is whether it is the shadow of some type of algebraic cycles or some actual complex geometric features of your actual space. And so this is one way that you can interpret this particular result. Right? We are constructing some type of algebraic cycles, namely these sections and multi-sections, and we are constraining the actual geometry of these spaces as well. You know, in particular, for these spaces to fiber over P1 in this manner, they have to be unirule. Okay. So this is the uh, algebra geometric motivation for this question. So the question that you should be asking me now is why does a symplectic topologist think they have anything to say about this problem? Okay, so, so this is very nice, but uh, there, there needs to be some symplectic motivation for why we can do this. And the symplectic motivation comes from the work of Seidel and later the work of McDuff on Seidel representation. So if you have a morphism to P1 that is smooth everywhere, so you have no singular fibers, then as an immediate corollary of the Seidel representation, you actually get the pi emits a section. 
Okay, so this again follows from the Seidel representation. And so this particular result of Seidel and Macduff was sort of the symplecto geometric intuition or motivation for why symplectic geometry had anything to say about these slightly more complicated families and their topology. So one thing that I will point out is that while both the methods of Seidel and Macduff and myself go through the symplectic category, they're nevertheless very different animals. Okay, so Seidel and Macduff really rely on the Seidel representation, or really this comes from the Seidel representation. Whereas for my construction, I am going to use a Fleur theoretic invariant called local symplectic cohomology. So I'm going to use some quantitative version of Fleur theory to actually detect the existence of these unit rulings and these multi-sections within our spaces. Okay, so let me just give kind of a very, very high level idea of what is the idea of the proof and kind of how we go about assembling these rational proofs. Okay, so let me start by roughly saying what this local symplectic, woo, I did not know what happened there. Oh, that's unfortunate. My screen froze. Let me try to go back. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so let me say something about what this local symplectic cohomology is. So this is some type of Fleur theory that associates to every compact subset of some convex symplectic domain, a chain complex. So as usual, the chain complex is constructed from some Hamiltonian dynamics, but in particular for this local symplectic cohomology, it's going to be constructed just from the Hamiltonian dynamics that are near our compact subset. So we're gonna look at some Hamiltonian. We're gonna look at its one periodic orbit, so its associated Hamiltonian vector field. And we're just gonna focus in somehow on the orbits that are nearby our compact subset and ignore the ones that are very, very far away. And then as is usual in Fleur theory, we're going to construct differentials from this complex using some type of holomorphic curves or really Fleur trajectories. Okay, so this is the invariant we're gonna use. And our strategy is going to be to apply this invariant to the complement of a singular fiber. So we're gonna to arrange to have one of our singular fibers over infinity. We're gonna rip this out. And now this is some open symplectic manifold over C. So I removed infinity from P1. So the strategy is going to be to show that this local symplectic cohomology vanishes for every compact subset of this open symplectic manifold. And so you kind of unwind all of the algebra and curve theory that goes into defining this local symplectic cohomology. And you find that the vanishing of this local symplectic cohomology group is actually witnessed by the presence of holomorphic disks inside of this complement that give sections or rather multi-sections over finite radius disks inside of C. So roughly speaking, if I have some compact subset inside of M that has vanishing local symplectic cohomology, then I can produce a multi-section over that associated compact subset. Okay, so this is almost what we want. So I'm telling you that Fleur theory gives us a way to produce holomorphic sections over disks. Really, we want holomorphic sections over the total space P1. So for this, we use a degeneration to the normal Carnot. So we use some symplectic geometry here to degenerate these sections over the disk into honest to God sections over P1. And so there's really two parts to this sort of uh, proof strategy. So there's the symplectic geometry side where we do this degeneration of the normal cone to produce sections from disks. And we kind of arrange our spaces in such a manner that we can do Fleur theory. And then there's the Fleur theoretic side of this. So there's this local symplectic cohomology computation that actually lets us produce these sections over disks. So this is the rough strategy. Uh, are there any questions? It's a good pausing point. And the main results, so when you say section, you always mean like algebraic section or something? Yeah, yeah, it's algebraic. Uh -huh. So somehow are the, in this outline, like are the disks you're finding are like, they're like Hamiltonian disks and then you're you know, turning off the Hamiltonian? And yeah, that's exactly what's going on. Yeah, so, so we have some flirt trajectories and I'll, I'll say something about this later, but we essentially kill the Hamiltonian perturbation term and see what type of curves survive as we do this degeneration. I see. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. 
So for better or for worse, I'm going to explain this now in the opposite direction. So I wanna start with the assumption that we have holomorphic sections over the disk and explain how we get sections over P1. And then I will go about explaining the sort of FLIR theory that we need to do to produce these sections. Okay, so let's talk about degenerating to the normal cone. So we're gonna to degenerate to the normal cone of our singular fiber over infinity. So let me pull up a picture and try to explain what's going on. So the degeneration of the normal cone is some type of flow up construction. So what we do is we take our space, M bar, and we cross it with C. So in this picture here, the horizontal direction is C, and the vertical direction here is M bar. And then we look over the origin inside of C, and we blow up along our singular fiber at infinity. Okay, so this is now some new space. So away from our blow up locus, we just have some smoothly varying copies of our M bar. So really it's just C star times M bar. And then it degenerates into some singular fiber where we did our blow up. So it's a little bit easier to actually think about this geometrically in the case where M bar is just a copy of P1. Okay, so when M bar is just P1, what do we have? So we take C times P1, which I can just draw torquically as the square. And then we blow up at zero and infinity. Okay, so if I blow up, I'm just lopping off this corner of my toric square. And this is the resulting toric model for this degeneration. Okay, so away from these two singular fibers, we just have some smoothly varying copies of P1. And when we degenerate into zero, we get two other copies of P1. So we get F0, which is just the proper transform of P1. And then we get this exceptional curve, E0. Okay, so all of these are just P1s. So we take one P1 and we're splitting it off into two P1s. So an analogous picture is happening here on the left side as well. Okay, so we have some type of complicated exceptional locus and we're taking our space M bar and we're splitting it off into this exceptional locus. And then this other copy, this transform of M bar under this blow up, F. So what's really nice about blow ups is that they are functorial. Okay, so. Given our map from M bar to pi, we obtain an associated map of the blowups. So as I vary towards the zero fiber in this degeneration of the normal cone on the left-hand side, I have a map that takes this fiber M bar and is identified with my original map pi to P1. And this map extends as we go into the exceptional locus. So in particular, if I look at pi, twiddle and I restrict it to the transform F, well, birationally, so really for the sake and purpose of just producing unit rulings or multi-sections, we can just think of pi twiddle restricted to F going to F0 as being identified with our original map pi. Okay, so this is telling us that we are basically taking our family M bar and we're degenerating it into a union of two families. One is this exceptional family here. This is some complicated animal. And then we have another copy of our family, which is birationally the exact same thing. So let me just really stress the geometry of what is happening here uh, with a nice picture. So in the Gromov topology downstairs, we are taking the smooth fiber here, BZ, and we're just cinching the equator as we go towards zero. So we're splitting this off and a bubble forms. And in the Gromov topology, this converges to a nodal holomorphic curve. It's just the exceptional fiber and the transform fiber F0. So we wanna use this geometry to now degenerate disks into actual sections. So let me try to state this precisely, semi-precisely with a lemon. So let's suppose that we have holomorphic maps of the disk into each one of these fibers of our degeneration of the normal cone. Okay, so we have some disk here, we have some disk here, and they're getting very, very close to the singular fiber. And let's suppose that when we take these disks, and we project them down under pi twiddle, that we get some very large disks inside of our copies of P1. Okay, so here I wrote the radius of the disk is two. Okay, two is kind of arbitrary, really it could be five or 88. You should really just think they're very, very large disks. So to be precise about large, the area of the disks in each one of these smooth fibers should be larger than the area of this sphere F0. Okay, but really you just have some very big disks. If these curves have uniformly bounded energy, so we're gonna apply some flavor of Gromov compactness, then 
we can conclude that pi actually exists, actually admits a multi-section. And so the, the picture is kind of the proof. So let's think about what's happening downstairs. So let's take these disks and let's project them down into our blow up of E1. Okay, so these are some very large disks. So they encompass the equator, the entire Southern hemisphere and a little bit more above. Them. So when we take the Gromov limit of these particular disks, as we degenerate towards the singular fiber over zero, what happens is we get a nodal holomorphic disk in the singular fiber. So if this disk is very, very large, then the boundary component of this disk is going to get pushed into the exceptional divisor of this blow up. And in particular, we're going to get a bubble that forms around the bottom half, this component F0. Okay, so just as we could take a sphere inside of the smooth fiber and degenerate it into two spheres in the singular fiber, we can similarly take a very large holomorphic disk in the smooth fiber, and we can degenerate it into a nodal holomorphic disk where the disk part is completely contained in the exceptional fiber, and a smooth bubble is formed in the transform fiber, this F0. Okay, so to get our multi-section, we just think about what's happening upstairs. Okay, so we have this sequence of holomorphic disks, and so we're going to apply Gromov compactness to this sequence of disks upstairs. Okay, but topologically, whatever is happening upstairs has to cover what is happening downstairs. Okay, so again, we get some nodal holomorphic curve with boundary, but its boundary has to cover the boundary downstairs in the P1. Okay, so the boundary of whatever this limiting disk is actually lies completely within this exceptional fiber here E, away from our space F. And in particular, we had some non-constant curve that was arising that covered F0. So this tells us there exists a component of this limit nodal holomorphic curve that is some closed curve inside of F that projects non-trivially to F0 or our copy of P1. So when we identify F to F0 with our original map pi, what is this telling us? Well, it says that we have some rational curve that has a non-constant map to the base. So this is literally just the statement that pi emits a multi -set. Alex, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. um, I, I was just losing track of uh, is is the boundary of the disk mapping to a Lagrangian? No, no. So this is a good question. So so in general, I am not assuming any type of Lagrangian boundary conditions on these disks that we have in this space. So I have to use some special type of Gromov compactness. So actually, in particular, um, I don't even consider bounds on the number of boundary components of these disks. So really, I have some genus zero curves with boundary, and I don't have any bound on the number of boundary components. Um, so to get around this issue, I use Fish's target local Gromov compactness result. So this kind of lets us appropriately apply some flavor of Gromov compactness for curves that do not necessarily have Lagrangian boundary conditions. Yeah, so no Lagrangian boundary assumptions are used here. And I guess you'll tell us about why you don't end up having any boundary components mapping into uh, F0? Well, it doesn't happen. You, you can't have any boundary components mapping to F0 because if you did, then they would cover boundary components. Oh, sorry, in F0. Well, if the disk is very, very large, you, you can just explicitly compute this by hand. Right, so, so if you just write down the actual sort of, you know, how this bubble is being produced in this Gromov limit, you see that if your boundary lies above the equator of this smooth sphere, then it has to get pushed into the actual exceptional divisor. Somehow what you should really be thinking is that the boundary is really living like way up here nearby infinity. And so as you degenerate, it's also getting pushed off here. So you get you know, basically something that looks like falling. But it's just kind of a, it's just a easy computation and in this particular blow up model. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so I should be responsible and I should cite the literature. So this idea of using the degeneration in the normal cone to produce curves from holomorphic disks um, is not necessarily new. Um, it's appeared in various different settings. I mean, the, the ones that I you know, got inspired by were some constructions by Seidel and Smith and uh, McLean as well. Okay, so, the uh, next question that you should ask me is that 
this proof that I gave you allows you to produce multi-sections. So the theorem was about sections in some case or unit rulings as well. So how do we actually build this data into this degeneration of the normal code? Well, if we wanna obtain an actual section as opposed to a multi-section, we just need to ensure that the projection of these holomorphic disks into P1 are degree one maps. Okay, so when we look at the projections of these disks downstairs, we just have degree one maps. So when we degenerate them in the degeneration of the normal home, we still get a degree one map. So it's just topologically preserved by Gromov compactness. And similarly, if we have some disks that have some point constraint, we can also degenerate to the normal cone while keeping track of the point constraint and actually get a unit rule. That is a rational curve that has some point constraint inside of our total space. Okay, so really there's not much interesting additions to be had to get these unit rulings and sections. Once you have this picture of degenerating a disk into a closed curve, this is, this is about the only observation you need. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, then I'll ask a question. So how do we produce these disks, right? So we want these disks in each one of these fibers of our degeneration in the normal form. So I've already hinted at this a lot. We are going to do Fleur theory in the complement of infinity. Okay, so let me just fix some notation. So let's let M sub A just be the inverse image of a disk of radius A inside of C. And similarly, we're going to let M just be M bar where we've removed the singular fiber over infinity. So I would like to do Fleur theory inside of this space M. So a priori, if I just pick an arbitrary Kähler form on M, it's not going to be convex, right? It's not going to be amenable to actually defining Fleur theory. You know, in general, if I take the induced Kähler form from the degeneration of the normal cone, it's going to be finite volume. Okay. So how we get around this is by constructing a sequence of symplectic embeddings. So we find some symplectic form, omega, on this space that's now living over C, and smooth symplectic embeddings of each one of the fibers of our degeneration of the normal cone into this fixed symplectic manifold, M omega. So this embedding satisfies two nice properties. So the first is that the image of the embedding lies within a compact subset, M sub A, for this symplectic domain. Okay, so we take these fibers where, sorry, we take these spaces where we've removed infinity and we essentially push them into some compact disk inside of M. And the nice feature about M omega is that the end of this space is modeled after a symplectic mapping cell. Okay, so this is not quite a contact type boundary, but it's good enough for actually doing flow theory. So here's the picture you should have in mind. So you have M and you have some arbitrary Kähler form on M, so it's probably finite volume, which I've tried to draw here. And then we just take some type of symplectic completion of our space M, and this gives us the symplectic embedding of this into some nice convex space. So maybe I'll be just a tad precise for any experts. What do I mean by convex? I mean that this space satisfies an integrated maximum principle with respect to flow trajectories. Okay, so it's not a contact type boundary, but for all intents and purposes, you can just think of it as a contact type boundary. Okay, we have all of the necessary machinery to ensure that flow trajectories don't escape to infinity when we define flow theory. So the second nice feature about being a symplectic mapping cylinder is that we have a nice description about what the rave orbits are for the radial Hamiltonian. So if I take my space and I project it down to C, and then I just take the standard radial coordinate C. This gives me some radial function R on this total space M. And in particular, the Rabe orbits that correspond to this radial Hamiltonian are just curves that wrap positively around the origin when they are projected down the C. So all I'm saying is that the one periodic orbits are just the orbits upstairs that project to the standard Rabe orbits inside of C with respect to the radial Hamiltonian. Okay, so sort of the dynamics is really just being captured by the dynamics of C, so to speak. Okay, so here's our goal to produce these sections. We want to show that for every compatible almost complex structure on this space M, we can find some holomorphic disk that covers the disk of radius A. 
And moreover, we also want the energies of these disks to be uniformly bounded independent of our choice of almost complex structure. Okay, so why is this our goal? Well, what we can do is we can take our fibers of the degeneration of the normal cone, so these P sub Zs, and we are going to embed them inside of our fixed symplectic domain. So we can take the almost complex structure on PZ, this Kähler or this integrable almost complex structure on this fiber of the degeneration of the normal cone. We can embed it inside of M and then we can extend it to an admissible almost complex structure on the entire space. So if we can produce holomorphic disks that cover the disk of radius A for any compatible almost complex structure, then we can use these embeddings to transfer disks back and forth between this fixed symplectic domain and the fibers of our degeneration of the normal cone. So namely, we push forward the almost complex structure, find our desired disk, and then we pull it back along our embedding facade. Okay, so this is the sort of trick that lets us reduce uh, the task of finding holomorphic disks inside of each one of these fibers of the degeneration of the normal cone to just finding them for arbitrary almost complex structures in some fixed symplectic domain. So now we are kind of at the other side of the story. So now we need to talk about how we are actually going to produce these holomorphic disks inside of our domain M omega. So let me pause before I go on to the second one and just check if there are any questions. Okay, so let's do some flare theory. So this local symplectic cohomology is some quantitative version of Hamiltonian flare theory. So we're gonna consider the following sequence of Hamiltonians to compute this flare theory. So we have this increasing sequence of Hamiltonians, H sub n, H sub n plus one, H sub n plus two, and it satisfies the following conditions. So first, they are increasing. So H sub n plus one is always larger than H sub n. If we are inside, m sub a, so this is a compact subset m sub a, so if our r coordinate is less than a, then we want the value of these Hamiltonians to go to zero. Similarly, if we are outside of m sub a, then we want the value of the Hamiltonians to explode off to infinity. Okay, so I can kind of be a little bit more precise. So on the interior m sub a, we just take h sub n to be some c2 small Morse function inside of this space, where we're taking it to have smaller and smaller norm as the n's increase. We assume that we have this monotonicity assumption that our Hamiltonians are increasing. And we also, for convexity reasons, allow for their slopes to increase as well near the boundary. But this is the following sort of key property. So if we have points that are inside our compact subset, the value of the Hamiltonians goes to zero. And if we're outside our compact subset, they go off to infinity. Okay, so one thing that maybe should be clear, but I didn't explicitly state, is we're working in a non-exact setting here. So to define flare theory, we need to work over some flavor of a Novikov ring. So the flavor of the Novikov ring that I'm using is the following. Okay, so it's the universal Novikov ring over Q, and it's really just Taylor series with exponents in the real numbers, positive real numbers. So what's a nice algebraic feature of the Novikov ring is that it comes equipped with evaluation. So given a Taylor series, the valuation of that Taylor series is just the order of vanishing of that Taylor series at the origin. Right? So we're just taking the lowest coefficient or the lowest exponential power. So this is some type of algebraic structure that comes with the Navikov ring and consequently descends to an algebraic structure on any modules over the Navikov ring as well. And we're going to use this algebraic structure to define these local symplectic cohomology groups. So let's do this now. Okay, so for each h sub n, we get some chain complex. So I haven't imposed any sort of conditions on C1 in the symplectic form, so I import uh, Pardon's virtual fundamental chains package. However, I conceivably could have done this with any of the virtual packages that exist out there in the world. So we get some chain complex CF h sub n, and it has some differential that is constructed by counting FLIR trajectories. So we have continuation. So as we go from h sub n to h sub n plus one, we just look at some increasing sequence of these Hamiltonians, and we get some chain map that goes between these two complexes. And in particular, by the assumption that h sub n was strictly less than h sub n plus one, this is actually defined over the Novikov ring as opposed to the Novikov field. So we have the following 
maybe slightly complicated definition of local symplectic cohomology of this particular compact subset M sub A inside of M. So let's try to unwind this. Okay, so we start with our Fleur chain complexes, CFH sub N, and then we take the co-limit or the direct limit as N increases. So we start with some finite dimensional complexes, and then we take the co-limit and we get some infinite dimensional module over the Nabokov ring. Then we take the completion with respect to this valuation that we had on the universal Nabokov ring. This gives us a new chain complex over the Nabokov ring. And then we simply take the cohomology of this complex. And for the sake of this talk, I'm going to tensor with the Nabokov field. So I'm just gonna kill Nabokov origin and not really worry about it. Okay, so this is the sort of precise algebraic definition of this. Uh, but how should you heuristically think about this? So heuristically, this is some type of algebraic gadgetry that lets you kill or ignore orbits of your Hamiltonian that lie outside of your compact subset M sub A. So the way to see this is to think about what's happening to the valuation of a generator as you increase in this colon. So if you have a generator, go back to my picture here, that lies inside of M sub A, then as you go from H sub N to H sub N plus one, the continuation maps are only increasing the valuation by some fixed amount. Okay, it's just some finite amount because the actual change in the Hamiltonians is virtually going to zero. Now, conversely, if you have some orbit that lies outside of your compact subset, the value of the Hamiltonians is going off to infinity. So the continuation has the effect of increasing the valuation on that orbit off to infinity. And so when you do this formal completion, it is an operation that is going to kill these orbits that have valuation that are exploding to infinity in this particular co-limit. So this is some algebraic way that we can just ignore orbits away from our compact subset and really just hone in on the Hamiltonian dynamics near the compact subset M sub A. Now this is, I, I do wanna stress that this is just a heuristic. So I like this name local symplectic cohomology in some sense, but I also really don't like this name local symplectic cohomology in some sense. So I, I wanna stress that this is local only in the sense that the generators of the complex are really local to this group, right? Fleur trajectory for the differentials that we can construct can go anywhere, okay? They don't need to lie nearby our compact subset M sub A. So they could exit for a very long period of time and then come back inside. So it's purely local on the generator level as opposed to the differential level. So it's a little bit of a misnomer. Okay, so yeah, flavors of this completed or quantitative Fleur theory have popped up over the literature in the past five years. So they've been studied by Sarah Venkatesh, by Umut Broganes, Mark McLean, Joel Broman. Uh, if you want to place mine somehow in your mind, you should think of it as an extension of Umut's construction to open convex symplectic manifolds. So, and in some cases, it agrees with the definition that Sarah gave as well. And it probably agrees with the one that Mark gives as well in the open setting, uh, but you have to show that like a derived limb one vanishes. Okay, are there any questions about the definition or what it heuristically means? Okay, so let's talk about some of these properties that it has. So the first is that this group is independent of all of our choices, right? So we chose some sequence of Hamiltonians H sub n, so it didn't depend on this sequence. Secretly in the background, there is also some admissible almost complex structure that we were using to define this flow chain complex. So it also doesn't depend on this admissible almost complex structure. So the next nice property is really a manifestation of the fact that I said that this was some local symplectic cohomology. So if M sub A is actually stably displaceable inside of our total space M, then this local symplectic cohomology actually vanishes on the nodes. So maybe I'll just remind you, a subset B is stably displaceable. If when I take B and I cross it with the circle S1 inside of the cylinder, so some core circle in the cylinder, if this new compact subset is displaceable in the product. Okay, so topologically, you can always displace the core circle of a cylinder away from itself. So there's no topological obstructions now to displacing the subset from itself with inside of the symplectic manifold. And so now you're really just honing in on some sort of Hamiltonian dynamics. So you've killed all topological obstructions. Okay, so morally speaking, why is this true? 
Well, let's just think about the case where M sub A is actually Hamiltonian displaceable, not stably displaceable. So this says that I can find some Hamiltonian whose associated vector field takes my compact subset and completely moves it away from itself. So if I use this Hamiltonian to construct these local symplectic cohomology groups, this says that I can find a sequence of Hamiltonians that have no periodic orbits that are lying nearby the compact subset, namely because it takes the compact subset and it completely moves it away from itself. Okay, so if I have no Hamiltonian orbits that are nearby our compact subset, it says that the valuation of all the other ones are blowing off to infinity, and so they get killed algebraically in this construction. So this is sort of morally the idea. And if you want to get stably displaceable, uh, you just use a Kuhn theorem. Okay, so this is the first property. The second nice property of these particular groups is an analogous property that arises when you consider the symplectic cohomology of a Liouville domain. So there is a natural map that takes the cohomology of the total space and it includes it as a subcomplex into this local symplectic cohomology of this compact subset M sub A. So what we can do is we can set SH plus hat suggestively to be the cone of this particular map. And given this cone, we obtain a long exact sequence that intertwines the cohomology of M, the cohomology of M with this local symplectic cohomology. So if you pick your sequence of Hamiltonians very nicely, you can actually show that this SH plus is really some completed analog of positive symplectic cohomology from the Liouville setting. That is, it's some chain complex that is generated by the Rabe orbits near the boundary of your compact subset M sub A. And you know, its differentials are given by counting flow trajectories. So one thing that I want to stress is that this is not an action filtration. So typically when you construct this subcomplex of the Moore's cochains into the symplectic cochains, you use an action filtration. So in our setting, the action functional is actually multi-value, right? So our symplectic form is not exact in the interior away from the boundary, but it's also not even exact near the boundary as it is in the contact type case. So we do not construct this filtration using the action functional. Instead, what we do is we just use the integrated maximum principle to just by hand topologically rule out any slur trajectories that would obstruct this map from being an actual inclusion of a subcomplex. Okay, so we don't have an action filtration, so we use the integrated maximum principle. Now, in the case where you are just working in a nice Leoville domain, this associated integrated maximum principle filtration essentially agrees with the one that you have for the action filtration. So this is just some extension to slightly more complicated symplectic domains. So these are the two properties that I want to hone in on. If our compact subset is stably displaceable, these groups vanish, and we have some long exact sequence that's intertwining this local symplectic homology group with the cohomology of our total space. So let's get back to the task. Again. So we wanted to find, yeah. Sorry, quick question. Um, on, the, on the last slide, does that, does that map from the uh, singular cohomology factor through the singular cohomology of MA or? It does, but also, so, so in this particular case, MA is just some level set of the collar, or, you know, it's, it's everything below the collar, so it's actually homotopy equivalent. Ah, uh, I see. So, so I could have, I, you know, I, I could have also written M today here. Gotcha. Uh, Chris, I think you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, is, is there any complication with the fact that you're just working with the Novikov ring here instead of the field? Like, like with the displaceability results as well, usually you need the field or something like that, right? So uh, right, so, so in general, if I work with just the Novikov ring, then it would state that this group is torsion. Right, yeah. So here at the very end, I tensored, when I defined this just for ease of this talk, I tensored oh, oh, at the I'm very sorry. end. I, ju I just missed that, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. so at, at the very end, I just kill torsion, so it actually vanishes. Can I also just ask, so, um, so as I understood, like, in, you're going to apply local symplectic homology to, like, the pre-image of a large disk for this yeah. type of thing, right? So is it, presumably, since you said these, these domains have a nice integrated maximum principle, you could also define, like, their intrinsic symplectic homology? Is that, is that usually non-vanishing? They're intrinsic. Um, yeah, so I, uh, that's a good question. Um, like, 
you know, if it was like, because it kind of, you know, you might expect in general, it looks something like a disc cross closed manifold or something. So it seemed, it sort of feels like it would, even the intrinsic simplicity homology would vanish, but. Yeah, I, you may be able to say something of this. So, so, so definitely in the case where, um, where you don't have a singular fiber over zero, this is absolutely true. In this case, you can actually deform this to be a product symplectic manifold. And so Kunitz says that it vanishes. Um, in the singular fiber, you may be able to just, yeah, actually get the symplectic homology vanishes or some you know, appropriate flavor in this non-Leoville setting. Um, but I haven't, I, I didn't really think about it too hard. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so let's let's use this information to start finding some curves in our space. So let's just consider an example. So let's suppose that this local symplectic cohomology vanishes. So if this local symplectic cohomology actually vanishes, then this tells us that the boundary homomorphism in our long exact sequence is an isomorphism. So you sit down and you do a little bit of algebra. You unwind what it means to be a long exact sequence here, constructed from this cone. And you see that this boundary isomorphism is actually witnessed by Fleur trajectories that connect ray orbits to critical points of the symplectic cochains. Sorry, the uh, Moore's cochains of your cohomology groups. So in particular, I have some Fleur trajectory that comes down and hits the unit inside of cohomology. So I have this Fleur trajectory. So I go from some ray orbit and I negatively asymptote down to some unit or some index zero critical point. Okay, so why is this almost good enough for us? Well, our goal was to find holomorphic disks that cover the disk of radius A for any almost complex structure, and we needed their energies to be uniformly bounded. So one can show using some continuation type arguments where you deform the almost complex structure or choice of Hamiltonian, that the existence of these bounding disks that go from ray orbits down to your unit class are actually independent of your choice of index zero critical point, as well as your choice of almost complex structure. So we get these slur trajectories independent of all of our choices. So now you should remember that the ray orbits of these particular families, M, were just given by orbits whose projection down to C wrapped positively around the boundary of our disk. Okay, so this is telling us that these slur trajectories are giving us pseudo holomorphic sections over our disk of radius A. So as Kyler pointed out earlier, these are not actually holomorphic sections over the disk. So now the idea is we want to apply a compactness argument. So we have these pseudo-holomorphic sections over a disk with some small Hamiltonian perturbation inside of M sub A. And we want to turn off this Hamiltonian perturbation in Fleur's equation to get genuine holomorphic curves. So let me draw a picture. So we're going to consider the following sequence of Hamiltonians. So this is my radial coordinate. And now I'm going to fix some fixed Hamiltonian, some radially admissible Hamiltonian near the end of the symplectic manifold. And then I'm going to consider a following sequence. So I'm going to have some sequence of Hamiltonians that are getting very, very, very small until eventually they go down to the zero Hamiltonian. So these Hamiltonians are going to be, let's say, h nu. And on the inside here, this is going to be some Moore's function divided by nu. Okay, so as nu increases, we eventually uniformly go to zero. And then outside in this particular region, one that's a little thicker, this is just some fixed radial Hamiltonian. So we're going to consider a sequence of Fleur trajectories associated to these particular choices of Hamiltonians. Okay, so we do this. So we look at some sequence, u sub nu, or u to the nu, and these are solutions to Fleur's equation. So let me just kind of break this out. And we consider the Gromov limit of these particular Fleur trajectories. So we can still use Fleur's compactness argument to get some type of holomorphic building. So inside, or sorry, away from our compact subset M sub A, we had some nice non-degenerate Hamiltonian. Okay, so we get some sequence of shifts that give us a holomorphic building. And since our Hamiltonian is non-degenerate, the orbits actually have to match up. 
So we get this nice sort of sequence of flare trajectories that are gluing up with themselves in the collar. However, inside now, once we've degenerated, our Hamiltonian is zero, right? So the orbits are extremely non-isolated. Okay, so in general, we still get the sequence of shifts. We still get these holomorphic curves, but now we can no longer conclude that they actually glue up with each other. Okay, so what is the sort of saving grace? Well, if you pick an interpolating sequence of shifts that interpolates between the shifts for U1 and the shifts for U3, all of these curves will converge to constant curves. Essentially, there's no energy floating around anymore. All of these non-constant pieces have picked up all of the energy of your original flare trajectories. And so if you consider any in-between shifts, you just get constant holomorphic curves. And so if you look at the family of all of these possible constant holomorphic curves between these two spheres, what they do is they trace out negative gradient trajectories of your background Morse function, right? So we took H sub nu on the inside to be some fixed Morse function divided by nu. And in particular, you can see that these paths of constant trajectories just trace out these negative gradient trajectory pieces. Okay, so this is the type of convergence that we get when we degenerate the Hamiltonian to zero. Okay, so the final observation that I'll make is that this X zero was the unit for cohomology. So in particular, the index of X zero is equal to zero. And each of these are negative gradient trajectories. Okay, so if I have an index zero critical point of the Morris function, it can't have any negative gradient trajectories going out of it. Okay, so if this was actually corresponding to the unit, we can actually just lop off this end gradient trajectory and we get some type of convergence that looks like the following. And so here's how we extract our rational curves for this picture. So this piece here, this has some rave orbit that's wrapping positively around the disk. So this red part is going to correspond to our multi-section. And now this blue part, this holomorphic bubble that's sitting by our index zero critical point is going to be our unit rule. Okay, so this is how we pick up these rational curves that have a point constraint, and similarly, the rational curves that, sorry, the disks that will give us our multi sections. Okay, so we're almost done. So if this local symplectic homology vanishes, then we conclude that there is a possibly disconnected possibly disconnected because I have this blue piece and this red piece. Genus zero curve with boundary, whose projection to C covers our disk and has some point constraint. And so we can use this degeneration of the normal cone to get our multi-section and similarly our unit rule. Can you say why, again, why the blue piece was non-trivial? Yeah, so um, this is an index zero critical point. So there exists no gradient, negative gradient trajectory out of it. So essentially you induct. So you can't have some tail here. So either you see a bubble or you see some other tail. If you see another tail, you can remove that. And eventually you have to see some non-constant bubble at it, or you actually run into the disc. Right. So, so it's possible that you have a sphere with the point constraint or you have a disc with the point constraint. In either case, you can still use the degeneration of the normal cone to okay. get your desired unit real. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so, so for the last five minutes, let me try to state why this is true. Okay, so we want these symplectic homology groups to vanish, so we get these nice sections and unit rules. Okay, so we removed the fiber over infinity. So if we have some map to C with no singular fibers, because we arranged it to be over infinity, or if we have one singular fiber at the origin, with the first turn class vanishing, then we can conclude this vanishing for all A in our space. So let me first say something about the C1 is equal to zero case because it's a little bit more interesting. So to prove this, we rely on some work by Mark McLean on his work on uh, symplectic crossing divisors as well as uh, his birational copy output. So we start with the following assumption. So if we look at this singular fiber over zero, this is some positive co-dimension subscheme of a Kähler manifold. So a result of Mark McLean tells us that actually a neighborhood of this singular fiber is stably displaceable inside of our total space M. 
Okay, so this says that SH of M epsilon vanishes for some epsilon extremely, extremely small. So this is our starting point. Now, of course, it's most likely going to be the case that M epsilon is less than MA. Okay, so we want some very large disk, but we probably just have it for some very, very small disk. So you sit and think about this and you realize that a disk of radius epsilon looks very, very similar to a disk of radius A, right? You can just kind of rescale a disk of radius epsilon to a disk of radius A. And this is sort of the idea. So you're going to consider a rescaling. And it's going in the opposite direction because this is sort of cohomology and you restrict. So the idea is to construct an isomorphism that goes from M sub A to M sub epsilon using rescaling of the associated FLIR data. And to actually state that this is an isomorphism, uh, we require this technical assumption of C1 is equal to C1. So let me try to spell this out a little bit. So what we do is we consider a diffeomorphism, some radially defined map that rescales M epsilon to M sub A. So you go from some small disk and you rescale it out to some larger disk. Now we take H sub N, our sequence of Hamiltonians that computes this local symplectic cohomology for M epsilon. And what we do is we construct an analogous sequence, Hn twiddle, that will be used to compute the local symplectic cohomology of M sub A such that they are related via the map phi. Okay, so if I have my Hamiltonian vector field nearby the disk of radius epsilon, phi, when I push it forward, just push it, pushes it forward to this Hamiltonian vector field for these H sub N twiddles. Okay, so if I have this identification of the Hamiltonian vector fields, I get an identification of the actual FLIR chain complexes. This is not an isomorphism, essentially because a disk of area epsilon behaves differently than a disk of area A when we start weighting things by the Nabokov parameter. So to actually upgrade this map to an honest to God isomorphism, what you do is you take your associated orbit and you scale it by the Nabokov parameter times the amount you rescaled times the winding number of the orbit about the origin inside of C. So in general, if these complexes, sorry, in general, these complexes are finite dimension. So this is actually an isomorphism of each one of these individual Fleur cochain complexes. However, when we take the co-limit, we get something that is now infinite dimensional. And so in general, this map induced on the co-limit is not going to be some bounded map. So it need not descend to an isomorphism of the completed colons. So we kind of use a similar strategy that Mark does. So we use C1 to get an honest to God grading on our Hamiltonian flow protein complexes. And we use some very nice sequence of Hamiltonians who actually show that this map, while not bounded, is degree-wise bounded, which is sufficient for us to actually conclude this desired isomorphism. But again, the high level idea is that we just rescale the dynamics on a disk of radius epsilon the dynamics on a disk of radius A, and then we use the vanishing of the first turn class to actually state that this gives an isomorphism. Okay, but uh, that, that was about all that I had. So I'll just stop here. Okay, well, let's thank Alex for a really nice talk, first of all. So questions? Uh, so yeah, Igor has a question. Do you wanna do you wanna just say it, or should we read? Uh, I can say, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, these are two two different questions, so I'm not sure which. So uh, one, I was wondering, like, uh, are there any uh, sufficient conditions on on the Keller manifold M so that it actually fibers over P1 as you uh, uh, as in your theorem? I don't. Hmm. I don't know, I don't believe so. And the reason why I don't believe so is because if you ask algebraic geometers about this, uh, they struggle to come up with examples of these families that actually fiber over P1, you know, that are not trivial or are not uh, uh, Herzberg surfaces or things like this. Um, so I, I don't believe so, but I don't know. And uh, yeah, so for your second question, is the proof of vanishing related to the proof of SH heaviness of the skeleton of, yeah, so this is related. So, so um, 
So, so Mark considers this rescaling isomorphism and then uh, Dimitri and Omet consider this a little bit more systematically with this SH heaviness property. Um, so yes, it, it is related. Uh, the sort of difference is that there, uh, the rescaling they're doing is for contact manifolds. And here I'm rescaling for uh, essentially symplectic mapping cylinders. So there's some technical subtleties that enter into these two differences, but yeah, it, it's absolutely related. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so I think Chris, Chris Woodward might have a question. Uh, so, so in the end you use C1 equals zero, but um, does, does it really go wrong if C1 is negative? What, what happens? So, so, so if C1 doesn't vanish, I can't conclude that this rescaling map here is actually an isomorphism. So sort of, this is not an example of something over C, but a good example to think about where this rescaling type argument fails is when you look at the, uh, can I add a page? No, I'll just write here. Uh, is when you look at the total space of O of minus one. Okay, so I'm gonna draw this torically. So you have this divisor here, D. So locally, if you look at some very, very small neighborhood at the zero section, this local symplectic cohomology vanishes. However, as you rescale that zero section or that neighborhood of the zero section larger and larger and larger, at some point you hit some essential Lagrangian torus. But that's, Sorry, that's, still, that's still C1 positive, so. I yeah, mean, C1. Oh, yeah. Um, does that also, maybe it also happens when C1 is negative, I don't know. I mean, it could, so, so in general, I, I mean, I believe that this still, this result still holds when C1 does not vanish mm -hmm. without any assumptions on C1. Mm -hmm. um, and so the reason why I morally believe this is true is because, okay, here we were using the grading from C1 to get this bounded isomorphism. Mm -hmm. So I claim that you can construct these sections in really two manners. You can do them from disks or you can do them from annuli over the associated families in C star. So if you think about now working over C star, what you'd wanna say is that there actually exists an invertible element with respect to the pair of pants product. And now when you're working in C star, the beautiful thing about it is while you don't have the C1 grading, you have the winding number grading, right? All of your FLIR differentials have to respect the winding number about these uh, in C star. And so I think if you work inside of C star, you can actually use this winding number assumption to actually establish similar isomorphisms when you rescale outwards. Um, but yeah, the C1 is equal to zero is, is really a technical crutch. I, 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 I suspect that actually these groups vanish and I'm just, you know, I don't have the correct perspective to state that they do. Thank you. Uh, essentially, you'd eventually have to hit some, you know, non-displaceable Lagrangian, and I, I, I don't see why there would or wouldn't be one. So. No okay. I'm just something I'm still a little bit confused about is so why doesn't this rescaling argument, like if you have like a you know in in P one you take you know a small disk will have vanishing local SH and a big one won't. So why doesn't this argument prove that those are isomorphic? It's because this map here, so this is an isomorphism of each individual HN and HN twiddle. So the point is the things that are that you need to compare are SH, well, yeah, I have it written down here. You need to compare SH hat with SH hat. So to do this, you take the co-limit over every single one of these chain complexes. This now gives you some infinite dimensional chain complex. And this associated isomorphism that you had is now no longer bounded. So because it is no longer bounded, it will no longer descend to an isomorphism of the completed symplectic cohomology groups. I see. So th this is somehow, this is some statement about when you're doing this rescaling, the you know, moment when you rescale and this fails is really the moment when you hit the Lagrangian that is the equator inside of P1, you know, I mean, essentially you're looking at some Novikov torsion 
And as you go towards the equator, the Nabokov torsion is getting larger, well, you know. So, but the, the assumption that fails is C1 of P1 is not zero? Yeah, is, I C1 we of P1 about, is not equal to zero. I thought we were talking about C1 of like P1 minus infinity. Ah, but that's a different space, right? So here we had to work in this convex symplectic domain. So really what we did is we took P1 and we embedded it inside of C with the standard symplectic form on C. In this case, every disk is stably displaceable. So that okay. Lagrangian is now flare theoretically trivial. Okay. I see. And, and so heuristically, I think a similar thing is happening with these more complicated spaces M. It's just, it's a little bit harder to get your hands on. Does that help? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so there's, uh, there's a question from Catherine. Can you feel it? Yeah, so this is a good question. Can I show that? Wait, sorry. Your symplectic manifold is a union of a stably displaceable part and a union. So, so the entire symplectic manifold is unibrual. And it, uh, yeah, so, so the entire thing is actually globally unibrual. Um, so so a, maybe a slightly more interesting question to ask is whether it's unibrual by these multi sections or sections in particular. So what I suspect is, so, so what I've proven is that it is unibruled globally and it admits multi-sections. However, I suspect that it's actually chain unibruled by multi-sections. And the reason I suspect this is because I really just don't think any of these gradient trajectories can actually arise in this particular limiting argument. And so really you should just be left with some type of disk that has a point constraint. And then when you degenerate this to the normal cone, well, you know, bubbles can form everywhere. So you get a chain of P1s essentially connecting your section class to some point inside of your space. Um, I mean, heuristically, I believe this because if you, work at, if you look at the work of uh, Diogo and Lisi, they give some computation for the symplectic cohomology, sorry, the symplectic cochain complex in terms of holomorphic planes inside of your space. Um, you know, if you were to construct some analog of this for local symplectic homology in this non-exact setting, and in fact, some virtual setting, then I would believe that you would just see that your differentials counting this particular boundary homomorphism are just actual holomorphic planes with a point constraint. Um, so uh, may maybe hopefully that answers your question to some extent. So, so they, they are globally unirruled in the multi-sections, and I suspect that actually you can essentially unirrule by the multi-sections themselves, but I don't prove this. Does that, does that answer it? Who is, whose question was this? Oh, wait, did I? Oh, sorry, I referenced Catherine while it was soon. Okay, but yeah, okay, he was happy. Sorry, what was Catherine's question? Uh, when you deform the normal cone, is it primarily the domain of the maps that is being deformed? Is the almost complex structure very yeah, so, so you can think of it in one of two different ways. So what I do, so this degeneration to the normal cone that you have, uh, it has some global Kähler form. And so over this base direction C, it's some Hamiltonian vibration. So you can do one of two things. Well, first you can observe that every single one of these fibers of the degeneration of the normal cone are biholomorphic to each other. So really you can just think of this degeneration as you're really degenerating the symplectic form in some sense on the domains. Now, what I do instead of degenerating the symplectic form is I symplectically parallel transport to symplectically identify the fibers, but this has the effect of non biholomorphically identifying fibers. And so I kind of recast it as a problem of deforming the almost complex structure on the domain. So you can think of it in one of two ways. And essentially because the fibers are symplectomorphic, they're actually equivalent formulations. Thank you. Okay, so uh, if there's no other questions, let's, um, well, let's thank Alex again, first of all. <laughs> <laughs>